Hi, and welcome to the inaugural event of the Yale Law School Faculty Book Talk Series. For those who are new to the law school community, the Law Library has a long tradition of hosting our faculty when they've published a new book. It's a, it's a great and unique opportunity to learn about the scholarship of our faculty and ask them to engage with our community as well. So tonight's book talk features Professor Bruce Ackerman, Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science. He will be discussing his new book, Revolutionary Constitutions, Charismatic Leadership and the Rule of Law. Professor Ackerman uh, is the author of 19 books on political philosophy, constitutional law, and public policy. In addition to his many scholarly works, he also writes for the general public, contributing frequently to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the like, as well as foreign news outlets. His scholarship has a global impact. This newest book, Revolutionary Constitutions, puts the worldwide constitutional crisis in historical perspective by comparing the post-war experience of radically different countries and demonstrating that these nations have a good deal to learn from one another in confronting the current assaults on checks and balances. Professor Ackerman is a member of the American Law Institute, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a commander in the French Order of Merit and the recipient of the American Philosophical Society's Henry Phillips Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Jurisprudence. So thank you for attending, and please join me in welcoming Professor Ackerman this evening. So what's so special about Trump? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, certainly not uh, that he wants to drain the swamp. Uh, this was the ambition of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson and uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and Lyndon Johnson, and Ronald Reagan, before we get to contemporaries. Uh, so that's certainly not what the different, different, each one had a different swamp, of course. That's a different point. Um, the um, each one, um, um, uh, uh, also, uh, as a result of his leadership of popular movement, um, uh, radically, but not overwhelmingly, radically changed, transformed the constitutional regime of its predecessor. Uh, the, uh, 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 so that's not special. Um, nor is it that Trump uh, manipulates the mass media. Uh, the um, uh, first press conference was uh, uh, as soon as we got uh, the commercial press of the uh, early 20th century, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt who had the first press conference. Uh, the um, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt reached tens of millions of people every week in its fireside chats. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson um, uh, gave, in, you know, after the tragic death of his predecessor, gave inspiring speeches that were on the floor of Cong uh, to, the, to the Congress uh, in state, uh, and not only in State of the Union addresses, uh, uh, in uh, a calling upon Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65, and this was you know, interrupted all the normal broadcasting. Um, uh, we didn't, uh, and uh, everyone, and tens and a hundred, you know, we, we, we don't need to go into the absolute numbers. It was gripping. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan's government is uh, the uh, um, you know, problem, you know, the solution, is conveyed through the mass media. And of course, Ronald Reagan is an actor. Um, to be sure, he uh, is a much more political. He had uh, experience uh, from the 1940s as head of the Screen Actors Guild, et cetera, and so forth. But he basically is an actor. 
who, uh, without that, uh, uh, could he have become governor? I don't know, blah, blah, blah. So that's not distinctive about Trump. Why is? Well, I leave that up to uh, you to ponder. Uh, 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 the, um, uh, and one of the roots of his specialness, if there is specialness, um, uh, the, uh, because uh, 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 I leave that up to you to ponder because it's the last chapter of, my, uh, of this book. Um, uh, a tremendous amount of, um, uh, of comparative constitutional law is, uh, uh, begins with Amer the United States as a standard case and then asks uh, in various forms of naive or not so naive way, why are the other countries different from us? Uh, in significant part, not entirely, because America, uh, English is the world language. So it is an embarrassing fact that exquisitely small number of leading scholars know any language other than English. Um, uh, this is a tragedy. <laughs> you, uh, you can't understand, uh, 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 even from afar, <laughs> uh, a French constitutional developments uh, since uh, uh, 1945 uh, 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 without understanding French. They don't, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, um, so uh, I, this is to be understood as an appeal to people who are graduate students or, you know, or uh, 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 English speakers who are actually interested in comparative constitutional law. And one of the things you should do is to learn another language. If you don't know, I mean, I, I happen to know Quite a number, uh, uh, but um, uh, but you should at least learn one. And if you know one already, learn another one. Okay. Um, so um, the um, uh, because as, uh, the a principal a thesis of uh, this book is that America is not alone in its revolutionary tradition. Um, uh, and that um, uh, um, uh, since the Second World War, um, revolutionary movements led by Nehru and Mandela in uh, uh, India and uh, South Africa under the Congress parties of these two countries, uh, which have a common origin, I should say, uh, um, uh, de Gasperi and de Gaulle in Italy and France, um, uh, Valenza and Khomeini uh, in Poland and uh, uh, Iran, all led political movements which culminated in the construction of new constitutions. Um, uh, and it's their initial constructions which are profoundly shaping, and one of my, one of the distinctive features of this book are first that I emphasize the regime revolutionary movements generating revolutionary constitutions of a regime kind. The courts only fit in to the regime um, rather than being court-centric. Uh, the long durée of 75 years. How uh, can these revolutionary beginnings after the uh, Second World War, do they still shape? the present. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, my uh, thesis is, uh, they do. You cannot understand uh, Modi's uh, efforts to revolutionize the Indian constitution today without understanding the founding constitution uh, by uh, Nehru Ambedkar in the name of the Indian National Congress. Uh, uh, you cannot understand Macron without de Gaulle, uh, uh, Kaczynski uh, without Valenza. Kaczynski indeed was uh, Valenza's pre principal confidant and right hand man during the first three years of the revolution, the constitutional era. Uh, uh, the, um, you also won't uh, be able to see how these crises stories, which are um, have relationships to success stories. You know, one of the sad facts right now is that uh, very few people are aware of 
the success story in South Africa. Uh, we have here Mbeki, who is uh, uh, trying to create an autocracy. I'm not going to give you details right now, but I'm happy to talk to you. If one of, everything I say is an invitation to a question, but we're not going to get too many uh, yeses and noes. Uh, um, uh, so uh, you can meet me in the hall or uh, knock on my office door. That's, uh, that's fine, too. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Ramaphosa's uh, a surprising um, a victory um, is uh, a, and uh, stopping the tr transparent slide to authoritarianism is a great success story. How, what is the relationship between Ramaphosa's relationship to the uh, Indian Congress Party and Modi's relationship to the, I mean, to, to the, the, the Ramaphosa's relationship to the African National Congress and uh, 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 and uh, uh, um, uh, Modi's relationship to the Indian National Congress. That's the kind of question I want to ask. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the conceptual point is uh, that we have to liberate ourselves from a Cold War thought which still motivates a great deal of our thinking about comparative uh, law, public law. Uh, the Cold War thought is that Mao and Lenin uh, are, and Hitler are the preeminent real revolutionaries of the 20th century, and that everybody else is nothing. They're just sort of incrementalists, and they move slowly. There are incrementalist stories, and I'll tell you in a minute, but um, uh, what all of these uh, uh, revolutions are about, the American Revolution, uh, 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 and all of these revolutions that we're talking about, is a revolution on a human scale. That is to say, there is not an effort to totalize, uh, total, you know, have a total change uh, uh, in the name of a, uh, uh, a vanguard proletariat, a vanguard party. There is a party, <laughs> or several, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it is trying to create a revolution on a human scale, changing some important things, but not everything. Um, uh, uh, and that's why constitutionalism is so important in revolutions of an, on a human scale. Because it's through the Constitution that you can create checks and balances. Uh, in a totalizing revolution, you don't want any. Because uh, uh, what we want to have is this great leap into the land of, you know, utopia. Uh, uh, but uh, in revolutionary uh, revolution on a human scale, uh, you do want uh, a constitutional, it's not anti-revolutionary, it's the way of uh, uh, expressing revolution. Okay. Take Iran, for example. Now, uh, which, uh, um, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, like uh, any number of people who I've mentioned, uh, not all of them, but almost all of them, um, was uh, in 1977 uh, observing the um, uh, 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 imminent uh, decline and disintegration of the Shah's regime in, uh, in Tehran uh, from Paris. He had been in exile for 13 years. Uh, and uh, very significantly, um, he... Um, uh, uh, asked one of his, he had a very small number of people working with him, uh, um, uh, confidants. Um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, 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 he's preparing, f he sees that he might be able to get back. I mean, he's been, you know, it's not that he voluntarily went to exile. He, <laughs> they kicked him out. <laughs> um, um, uh, he asked a trusted confidant, one of a small number, uh, Hassan Habibi, um, to draft a constitution to express the fact that after 2,500 years in which uh, the Persian monarchies have been one of the great 
civilizations of the world. We're going to have an Islamic republic. The new beginning is not only that it's Islamic, uh, uh, but it's a republic. So, Habibi, you have a doctorate in law and sociology at the Sorbonne. Draft made constitution. Uh, the original draft of the uh, Iranian constitution is 85% word for word copied from the Gaullist constitution of 1979, which is not the Gaullist constitution, <coughs> the original Gaullist constitution. Um, 85%. There is not a word of the supreme leader. Nothing. Um, uh, uh, the uh, powers of the, uh, there is ways of, uh, of expressing the Iranian, the Islamic part features of the, of the Republic. But the foundation is the Gaullist way, which is, of course, to have a, an elected president. Um, uh, and to have a council that is uh, 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 charged with making sure that these elections uh, be held in a fair way. Um, copied directly from the French. Um, the um, um, to make a, a long story sh uh, uh, short, um, um, there is uh, this is uh, uh, there's a surprising fact today which is rooted in this thing. I can tell you the stories. I mean, the book goes through this, I mean, in case by case. Uh, the, um, the surprising fact today is, if you might notice, that um, the uh, person who speaks for Iran, uh, so far as the nuclear agreement is concerned, is the president of the republic, not the so-called supreme leader. Uh, not only is it that Rouhani speaks for the government, that's the president, um, the supreme leader is on record time and again, the person, the not so supreme leader, that's my thesis, uh, is uh, on record time and again in opposing any nuclear uh, agreement with the West. In the last two elections, he put up a candidate or several, uh, 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 who were supporting the supreme leader's expressed position. I mean, it isn't that he kept it secret. Uh, uh, and in each case, there is an opponent. Rouhani was uh, uh, the opponent in the first election. He wins. And in the second election, when it becomes... Uh, when this is the crucial issue, uh, he uh, wins 57 to 43 over the Supreme Leader's candidate. It is for this reason that uh, the Supreme Leader, even though he's called a Supreme Leader, he's not called a Supreme Leader, well, there is words in that, but he is the, uh, 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 the jurist. Um, uh, he is the Islamic jurist. Um, uh, he is opposed to what he can, doesn't have the legitimacy to stop it. Even when Trump says no. Um, he, the Rouhani says, well, let's still make a deal with the Europeans. Now, I'm not interested in this book in um, uh, the, you know, who's right and who's wrong in all these things, whether you should, we should have an Islamic Republic or not. This is not my, my thing is to try to uh, tell these stories as they evolved and to get you to understand how the actors and why they did what they did. Uh, what were their problems? So we could compare the problem of, uh, 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 the uh, um, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, with the problem um, uh, uh, of um, uh, Nelson Mandela. 
both, both of them are in exile, uh, internal exile. He's in jail in, in the case of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of <coughs> Mandela. Uh, not so, uh, but both of them, when they get out, are out of touch with the revolutionary forces, actually mo mobilizing in the country. They have a problem. How to, they're, they're symbolically central, but effectively they don't know what's going on. Um, how to uh, sustain their symbolic leadership, which they earn through heroic sacrifice. Both of them select constitutionalism as a way of bringing all these disparate mobilizational elements together. Um, okay. um, countries with a revolutionary, okay, two, five more minutes. Countries with revolutionary traditions uh, have no trouble uh, integrating popular referenda in their constitutions. Um, the, um, uh, if properly structured, they provide uh, a plausible pathway for new uh, uh, movements to have their own uh, mini revolutions on a human scale. Uh, uh, so, for example, in Italy and uh, the uh, question of whether we should legalize divorce, that was a referendum, um, even, et cetera, and so forth. Um, However, there are these two other paths, which are not talked about this, but will be talked about in volume two um, uh, of this never-ending saga, my life, <laughs> um, in which the very idea of referenda is much more challenging. The first one is establishmentarian. Uh, uh, the UK provides a, a paradigmatic case. Uh, the Scandinavian countries are similar, and uh, uh, the Canada um, uh, uh, Australia and New Ze Zealand have distinctive way of problems in copying the uh, British model. Their Commonwealth model, as Stephen Gardbaum, in one of the best books in the last 10 years on comparative constitutional law, uh, has called it. Um, uh, basically, in the UK from 1832 to the day before yesterday, and I mean that literally, uh, <laughs> oh, the day before three years ago, um, <laughs> Uh, every um, every de every generation, uh, just as in the cases of the United States, I should say, uh, there's a revolutionary movement. Uh, 1832, uh, uh, 1848, uh, uh, the we can go on. Um, each time, the British establishment succeeds in splitting the revolutionaries. Revolutionary, not in the proletarian sense, although they're, you know, and not in the, you know, uh, total totalitarian sense, although that's there too, uh, but uh, uh, revolutionary on a human scale. Um, what the uh, British establishment does is split the revolutionaries into the sensible ones and the crazies. Co-opt the sensible ones, bring them into the establishment, uh, and rejuvenate and re-legitimize the establishment. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, this we can talk, uh, the, the paradigmatic example of the, in the 20th century is the uh, Parliament Act of 1911, which uh, until that time, the House of Lords uh, could veto anything. Completely undemocratic. Um, uh, you know, well, we, uh, uh, the Parliament, uh, and they were vetoing uh, uh, um, uh, Basically, wealth tax, income tax, taxing the lords who own to this day, you know, the, Brit the British uh, land ownership is extremely concentrated. Um, uh, uh, well, uh, somehow or other, um, they uh, were persuaded uh, uh, not to uh, give in uh, to the <coughs> radical demands for, you know, the welfare state. Even, uh, um, and at the same time, the uh, uh, extreme people were saying, look, we, have a, we want a, a republic. What is this business? Bow down, ye lower middle classes kind of crap that they're, they're doing. We want to sweep away the lords. We want, we want a republic. <laughs> um, 
maybe next generation or five. <laughs> um, now, this establishmentarian model has a very difficult time with referenda because it's incompatible with the establishmentarian notion that there is the best and the brightest who are uh, open. We can get more, pe you know, more people in as times change, uh, uh, but it's parliament, it's the House of Commons as an expression of the establishment right, that is the way to sensibly govern the uh, uh, United Kingdom. And that f philosophy, after all, uh, uh, in 1939, uh, uh, was here as this small country, right, governing uh, more than one sixth of the population of the world. So you do a bad job. Uh, the um, uh, when you look at the Referendum Act passed, it explicitly says this is advisory. There is no mandate. Um, and suddenly they're all talking about it as if a 51.5 to 48.5 victory uh, on the basis of weak information is a mandate. How did this happen? Well, um, uh, they, I mean, they don't know how to handle it. Um, the, I mean, Britain is a, a third-rate power at the present time, uh, and so, uh, what, and of course, it's culturally significant in all this. I mean, you know, the, the great power in uh, Europe is Germany, not Britain. Uh, uh, the, uh, the second uh, 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 power is France. Not um, the, uh, uh, but uh, they, uh, they're still culture, you know, they're still important and all of that. And of course, for cultural reasons, it's just, this is a, one of the most successful democracies. Um, uh, uh, but it, uh, it's still a um, relatively minor league thing we're, while we're watching it. Uh, but, uh, but we you don't have the same scariness uh, associated with Trump. Be, uh, but Trump, you see, is less of a constitutional crisis. It's a huge one. <laughs> but so is Andrew Jackson. So is Franklin Roosevelt. But this constitutional crisis goes to the very foundations of the legitimation model of the UK. Uh, and it's so painful, and, 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 and you know, you just have to you really listen to the, uh, uh, watch the thing on the Guardian. They have a whole, uh, 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 not Instagram, but to, you know, an hour uh, or two. Uh, they're you, they're showing you the debate on, in the in the comments right now, and it's obviously this is like a you know, shambles. Here's a fellow, the Speaker of the House, who is exercising powers not exercised by a Speaker of the House since the 1634. And uh, he's doing it, you know. <laughs> this is incredible <laughs> um, because everything else is delegitimized. Okay. Um, the final model, and I will leave it for, uh, for one minute, uh, is the um, uh, elite construction model, uh, as in Spain, for example, uh, where. Uh, um, uh, Juan Carlos, the king, uh, the, uh, is uh, educated by Franco, and from the age of four, he's taken away from his parents uh, and brainwashed into the wonders of phalangism. Uh, uh, he rebels. Sigmund Freud is very useful here. Um, uh, but he doesn't, because Franco knows he's going to die, he needs a successor. Um, uh, certainly, uh, he doesn't want the crazies, commies, to take over. Um, uh, he wants to deploy the legitimacy of the monarchy uh, um, at, to sustain this, and he uh, uh, fails. Um, uh, but it isn't as if there's a new mobilization. The Catalonians and uh, other popular movements are shoved to one side by um, uh, the king and Suarez. Um, even more so in the cases of Germany and 
uh, Japan. These constitutions are written by the Allies. The Germans deny it, but it's true. Uh, the Japanese are all too aware of it. This is the MacArthur Constitution. Uh, 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 they have real troubles, even deeper ones, with referenda. Um, okay, last line. Uh, the analysis, among other things, suggests, uh, 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 and that's a very key th point uh, uh, when we are uh, looking at the uh, 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 revolution attempted uh, uh, in Japan right now, uh, but the, uh, to repudiate fundamental elements of the uh, MacArthur Constitution, and especially the peace article. Uh, but the bottom line in, of this analysis is that the European Union has a special legitimation problem. The great powers of Europe come out of different legitimating traditions. Um, uh, Spain and Germany are elite constructions. Uh, uh, France and Italy are revolutionary on a human scale, as is Poland. The UK is establishmentarian. So not only do they disagree about substantive issues, which is only reason, you know, there are many reasonable questions of uh, this is for disagreement about the design and the future of the European Union, but they even disagree about how to resolve them. They disagree about how to disagree. This is a distinctive problem, which is not to say they can't be solved. Uh, but the aim of this book is not to solve problems. I mean, I try to do that in other uh, dimensions of my work, but to help us understand them and to move beyond the headlines. Because the headlines are making you think that uh, Boris Johnson is just like uh, Donald Trump and that Modi is just like Boris Johnson. And, like, you know, and that there's a worldwide crisis of constitutionalism, which is true. But it isn't true, it is, doesn't follow from that, that the reasons for this crisis are the same. Uh, there are many reasons that I'm not talking about. Economic reasons, uh, um, you know, there are demographic reasons, lots of reasons. Um, I'm only talking about one important, but not all important, set of reasons, constitutional legitimation. If, a, if, a, uh, if a, the population generally understands their regime to be legitimate, that is an important feature. If they don't, that is a crisis of, that, you know, that helps facilitate the crisis of democracy. And that's the thing that law school and interdisciplinary work in political science and history and, and uh, even philosophy uh, can help us understand.